All right, round two. All right. Okay, here we go. All right. Uh, so this is going to be about metrics, mission, and money today. And just to give you a little bit of a background, um, I was a public radio reporter for a long time at WBEZ in Chicago, started a series called Curious City, which was really experimenting with the editorial process to center the public and their direct information needs. And so it's an ongoing series. It's, I think, in year seven or eight now. Uh, no, more than that almost 10. Oh my goodness. Um, and it's terrific and been going well and we've replicated the model all over the place. And in the process, we've learned just a ton about engagement that um, really transcends our particular model or transcends Harkin, the company that I started that helps to take these lessons and, and expand them um, out in the world. So what we're here today is to tell you about a lot of just engagement truths and, and things you can try regardless of what methodology you're using, what technology, um, how you're doing it. So it's the goal is to really be uh, very useful here. And then Summer, do you want to say a quick hello and a bit about yourself? Yes, hello. I see familiar faces. I'm really excited to support today and uh, get to meet more of you. So I'm from Chicagoland, connected with Jen way back when, when she was starting or in the midst of Curious City. Um, and I'm a big public media enthusiast as well, and have a chance to connect with folks across the system um, and learn from you. So very excited for today. Great, thanks, Summer. And yeah, please hit up Summer in the chat if you have any specific questions. Um, so today's gonna be interactive. We're gonna go pretty quickly through a lot of different content. Um, and this is just a little roadmap for what you can expect. We'll have a stretch break as well, but I wanted to start off giving you some high level context Let's then talk about how to define engagement since it is such a slippery word that means a million things. <laughs> um, why you should engage, like what's, what, what are the benefits? Um, and then how you can start to align all of those things, your money, your metric, and your mission. And then we're gonna go into an exercise that you can uh, get started on today collectively and then take back to your newsroom to complete and then just some reflections. So that's where we're headed. If you have questions as we're going, please feel free to just unmute yourself or type in the chat and then Summer, feel free to um, shout out those questions as they happen. So we'll hopefully have time for questions at the end as well. But if there's a moment where you're like, wait, 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 you know, I'm stuck here, please, please unmute. Okay, so beginning, I just wanna situate us in the context that we're in right now. And there's a million different ways to look at it. So I'm going to give a high level kind of generalized view of our context, but this is what I've been experiencing myself as a journalist and working with a bunch of newsrooms, and I'm guessing you've experienced some of this as well. So there is a paradigm shift afoot that uh, is due to a lot of different reasons, but if we look at just the pure economics and the digital age that we're in, um, we're kind of still working in a lot of ways in the, uh, in the old era. <laughs> so the, the way information used to work is obviously um, not everyone was a creator. So news and information had gatekeepers, whether that was, you know, your local news organizations, uh, TV, radio, newspaper, doesn't matter. These were the people you went to for news. You couldn't just go to anybody. Um, there was scarcity of it. And then you had these designated platforms for it. And obviously the way it works now is that everyone is a creator. Everyone can be creating news, streaming news, making it. And we don't have information scarcity. If anything, we have a glut. So this traditional newsroom model that we are still kind of trying to transition from is optimized for speed, efficiency, and distribution. And you know that your newsroom is still in this model if you hear people talking about feeding the beast all the time. <laughs> because whether that's the broadcast clock or a certain amount of articles you need to post every day or put in social media, this is about being focused on filling containers, whether that's you know time container or a length container, or width container, et cetera. And it's really for that machine age. It's not an information age model. And because it's optimized for speed and efficiency and trying to get things out to as many places as possible, the public is shut out of the process, right? Because if you involved the public and you did engagement, it might slow you down a little bit and make you a touch less efficient, which would be in conflict with this model. And so the public in this model is largely treated as a consumer from which to extract value and not a partner. But what we're seeing emerging and what we're all kind of riding this new wave of is uh, this model that's optimized for relevance and trust and for listening. Because what we know is that when there's a crisis in trust in an institution like media, but like so many other things, healthcare, government, etc., if you don't have trust, 
people aren't even going to bother reading you. So it doesn't matter if you put out a thousand, you know, great podcasts or one, people don't trust you, you don't have an audience. So you need to build that trust. And the only way to do it is really through relationships and through listening and making sure that what you're creating is as relevant as possible. Again, people are not at a lack for information right now. They're at a lack for finding the information they need to make decisions on their lives and kind of making sense out of the chaos that is our information ecosystem. And so with this emerging model, engagement becomes just obvious as what you need to do. You need to focus on what can you help the public understand or do, and the public has to be engaged in the process because you can't assume to know what information they need. They come from different backgrounds. They have different um, specifics in their lives where they might really be curious about something you or your team would never think to ask about because let's say you're not um, you know, someone who's a first generation American or someone who is in this socioeconomic class, all these different things, you are trying to serve many audiences and you just can't know what it is they need to know unless you ask them. And so the public is treated as a partner in this process. So just another grounding here in terms of context, this is where we see the industry still is kind of treating engagement um, as a project. And that's totally fine. That's where it really all begins. You can't just jump into doing engagement and a whole new model of operating out of nowhere. You need to get good at it. You need to kind of like crawl, walk and run. So we just see a lot of partners who have been successful in doing some engagement projects, but haven't yet been able to translate that into a practice that more than let's say one or a couple people in a newsroom do, or that isn't just an occasional thing that you know you cycle up and then cycle down every so often. But what's exciting, what I'm going to argue here is what we've seen the proof of, is that when you turn it into a practice, it can become a profit center for your organization. So when reporters, when editors, when producers are engaging with the public, the people you're trying to serve, you are getting great information about them, whether that's their email address, you know, phone number, demographic information, et cetera, that helps the people who are responsible for bringing in revenue to grow the amount of people who are subscribers, members, uh, donors to your news organization. So I just wanna preview this. We'll get into some of the details later about the profit center, but just know engagement is actually a path to sustainability and not a distraction. Okay. So I just want to do a quick self-assessment here. And in the chat, I would love for you with this model, which I know is limited and overgeneralized, to just write in the chat if you feel like your newsroom is operating still more from the traditional model or it's more in the emergent space. And if your newsroom is kind of in more of a project level practice or it's integrated engagement into creating a profit. So I'm going to see if I can open the chat here and see alongside. Okay, great. So just write it in the chat when you have a moment. Um, two, two answers to questions here. Is your newsroom still more traditional, kind of like feeding the beasts and optimizing for speed and efficiency and distribution, or more emergent, um, where you're kind of taking the cue from your audiences? And then the second question is, are you still doing engagement as a project or has it become a practice? Okay, great. So we have a couple here. Emergent project, are we a practice? Emergent project. Great. A lot of emergent here. This is terrific. Uh -huh. Emergent for newscasts or emergent for special projects, but traditional for newscasts. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. QPM in the process of getting profit. Okay. This is terrific. All right. So people are in a variety of places here on the spectrum. This is great. Um, and there's no wrong way. Like, it's really, really hard to do this. So I don't want this to feel like any public outing of like, I, you know, I'm embarrassed for a traditional work project. Like everyone is starting from this place, unless you're a newsroom that started from scratch and you're totally throwing out the rule book. So this is a natural progression. And what I'm hoping I can share today will help you move a little bit more into the emergent and a little bit more into the practice and into profit. Okay, so moving right along. I just wanted to also say these are real barriers that you might be experiencing. There's, there's many others as well, but there's a lot of barriers to adopting this philosophy and process. And so if you have been in conversations about limited resources, like we would like to engage, but we don't have the money or leadership is saying, but we're the experts here. Like we know what the public is supposed to know. Um, they shouldn't have any say in what we produce. Then there's the real thing of saying, okay, yes, we're bought in. We want to do engagement, but 
how do I change my day? <laughs> I've gotten really good at taking the, you know, the day part and turning that into assignments and cranking stuff out. Like, how do I actually start to shift into a new mindset? That's, that's a real big thing. And then just the cultural barriers around um, who's in charge and who gets to make the decision as to when you're engaging or not. So I just want to affirm if you're experiencing any of these, you're in good company. This is normal, normal, normal. But the flip side of all these problems and these barriers is that public media out of any other like group of media is uniquely set up for success with engagement. Your business model of having the public support you through being members, through donating, through you know the goodness of their heart means that you are already tuned to try and be as relevant as possible as you can be for them. And engagement is only going to help you be more. So I just grabbed a quote from the CPB website that public media creates and distributes content that is for, by, and about Americans of all diverse backgrounds, services that foster dialogue between the American people and the stations that serve them. I mean, in the CPB, it's saying that this content is by Americans of all diverse backgrounds. And I know most newsrooms are not quite there yet in terms of representing their communities uh, demographically. So engagement is one path to starting to get those voices around your editorial table and that dialogue that creates that dialogue. So I just wanted to say congratulations, you are in the right type of media for this new context switching. And I'm really excited that you have the support from each other and from America Amplified to get some more practice in this. All right, so on to engagement. What is it? It's one of those words that like means everything and nothing at the same time. So collectively, I want us to come to some terms of agreements, even if it's not like we have the perfect definition that's going to work for your newsroom. I would love for us to collaborate on what it means to engage. So this is a question I want you all to take about 30 seconds or so, and you can write it in the chat when you have an answer to these two like mad libs. So how do you know when your audience was engaged with you or your newsroom? And then how do you know you engaged them back? So just think about any experience where you're like, yeah, that was a really good project where we had good engagement. Just tell us what, what did they do? Did they call in? Did they donate? Did they send you pictures, et cetera? And then what did you do in response? So I'll give you 30 seconds and write in the chat when you have an answer for when you successfully engaged your audience um, in both ways. And if you don't have a great answer for both, that's okay. Just put in whatever your answer is for one of the two of these. Okay, fabulous. We're getting some good stuff in. Okay, so I'm actually going to go out of screen share mode and just type in some of these um, that you all are sharing. So could I get uh, someone who wants to go off mute and tell tell me a little bit about signs your audience is engaged and you engage them back. I know your new group together. I can do. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. I'm, uh, Stephanie Colombini with WSF in Tampa. And um, several times throughout this year, we put out um, call outs. We had a Google forum for people to share their experiences with COVID-19, whether they survived the illness themselves or if they worked in the healthcare industry, teacher, et cetera. Um, we would talk about it on the air, on social media, and we knew we were engaged when we got great feedback and a lot of people responding and filling it out. And then we, in turn, talk to a lot of those people and produce multiple series of audio postcards, just giving them platforms to share their story and taking us out of the equation. And they were all really successful. Fantastic. That is great. Thank you. That's a perfect example. Anyone else want to go?
I can jump in. Um, I know we host listening sessions. So I know that our audience is engaged when they've attended one of our listening sessions. Um, and then a sign that we've engaged our audience is that we produce content resulting from feedback that we got from that listening session. Excellent. Okay, thank you so much. Anyone else? We'll take one more. There's some really good ones in the chat too. Well, Jennifer and Juno, um, I had a very kind of literal definition of engagement. Um, our audience is engaged when I see that they are like reading a story on our website mm -hmm. and like all the way through. So like sort of the chart beat definition of engagement. Um, and then we uh, engage with our audience when we use um, people who comment or respond to a story um, as a source in a follow-up story. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Excellent. So you're not just seeing people as consumers, but contributors too, sounds like. Okay, fantastic. These are all really, really great, strong definitions of engagement. So I'm gonna go back into screen share mode here. And this really illustrates what you, the three of you shared is that it's about a mutually beneficial relationship. We jokingly call it the engagement ring because outside of journalism, the word engagement means, you know, to be in a mutually beneficial relationship, to have a promise to one another, to be helpful and attentive to what one another needs. So it's really when members of the public are responsive to you and you're in turn responsive to them. So it's this mutually beneficial relationship. And we've kind of created um, this feedback loop. There's lots of other steps you could add here, but at its very root, you could think about it starting in the upper left is that the news organization invites um, input from the public for the first time. I know it says again, but it's a loop, so it'll be again. Then the public provides input, which is great. And hopefully you've never had a call out where no one has answered. And if so, you were able to adjust and, and help make it easier for people. Um, and then this is where a lot of newsrooms actually fall short. Um, they get input, but they don't necessarily do something with it. They just say, hooray, we got 100 voicemails, but like it doesn't turn into anything all the time. And if you stop at that point, our joke is that um, you risk becoming an asshole, um, which means you're just someone who's asking for a lot, but you're actually not producing anything in response to it. You're just taking. And so in order to not be an asshole, uh, you have to listen to that input, you have to acknowledge it and thank people, and then you have to create something that is informed by it. And you need to let people know that they actually made a difference because otherwise they might think you're being an asshole because they didn't hear any follow up from that. And then you can do it again and again and again. So it is this positive feedback loop. If any of you have learned or heard about design thinking, this is a very similar approach. Um, it's just kind of a tried and true formula and how it manifests for you can be specific and different depending on your newsroom, if it's a digital project, if it's an ongoing story, et cetera. So our shorthand version is a litmus test for if like authentic engagement actually happened. Um, if there's no pathway for input from your audience to actually shape the decisions you're making, then it's not really authentic engagement. It might be consuming content, it might be marketing content, et cetera, but it's not actually you being in relationship with them. So it's that partnership is the real, um, the real thing that makes the difference. And so this is a very big slide. I'm not gonna read everything on it, but, um, and you'll also get this the, the slide deck afterwards here. But we have this framework around engagement that there are a few different flavors of it and you wanna stay away from extractive engagement. So that's everything on the left. And you know your engagement is being extractive. If it's just designed to benefit your newsroom, but not the people who you're trying to serve. And that, you know, some of the signs that that could happen would mean there isn't context given for why people should engage, you don't follow up with them. Uh, and the participant overall is not left any better off than they were before. You're asking something and you're not giving them anything back. So that is one you want to avoid. The center transactional is probably the most common path that we see, and it's fine, it's neutral. It's just a, hey, we want you to engage in this way, you engage in this way, thank you very much. Maybe we'll be in touch again later, maybe not, but like it's a fair trade and you're just very clear about the fact that um, this is how you're engaging at this moment. Transactional engagement, totally fine. Relational engagement, we believe is where there's some real magic and where there's some real kind of like transcendent opportunity to do things in new and innovative ways. So this is about really generating deeper relationships and insight with the people you're serving. 
And so you give them a deep context. And maybe this is something these listening sessions have that, that was mentioned, um, where you are there to not just say, we have a predetermined menu of things, which of them would you like? You actually start further out and you get more information and you might even create new things that your newsroom never would have before because you are listening a little bit more widely. You're not having them choose from something you've already narrowed down. You're giving them more power in the process. And so this creates the opportunity for co-creation, for new ideas, for new events. And the participants are left better off than they were before. Um, because they got to create something with you. They got to be part of something bigger than them, and they got to really be heard in a deeper way than just kind of like a quick transactional approach. So this is just here for you to keep in mind as you're doing engagement um, and just asking yourself whenever you start a project or um, some sort of call out, you know, how do we at the very least be, make this transactional and, and fair? And then, you know, if possible, at what points can you even widen that lens to, to have it be relational? Okay, I want to just take a stretch break for a moment and also see if there's any questions that people have before we go on. Is this making sense? How is everyone doing? <laughs> okay, any questions? Keep going. And Summer, if you want to add anything too to what we've said so far, please feel free. No, I'm just wondering, um, feel free to chat if anything's resonating as well and to chat any questions. Okay, super. All right, so now into like, why should we actually engage? Um, I've hopefully given you a few reasons so far, but there's so many reasons um, that we should actually just catalog them together. Um, so I'm gonna go into this mode again to, uh, I would love to hear from you all about what engagement can do for your work or brand. And if you have an example to share, please tell us the story of what engagement did do for your newsroom or your brand. And pick any one of these, if it uh, benefited you editorial, financially, or in some other way. So love to hear folks come off mute, whoever wants to share like what engagement has done for your work or for your organization. It would be great if you would also use um, the raising hand function, which is under reactions, and I could look out for folks. Oh, as great. Well. well, thanks, Summer. So it's next to the record button. All right, anyone want to share? Oh, yes, Jen Pemberton, Jennifer. Um, just real quick, I think engagement editorially can create um, popular content, just content that people really like. That's great. Do you have an example of, of something that uh, y'all have made a KTOO? Yeah, we recently did a very Harkin style story for, um, you know, our, we have a curious Juno thing where people send in real random questions. And I at some point want to talk about sort of the sort of fluff that comes out of that and how we sort of move that. But um, somebody remembered that there used to be a, a rifle range in the basement of the elementary school, um, like in the nineties. And so we did um, a story of just like, not just like, oh, do you, you know, who remembers the rifle range um, in, the, in the basement of the elementary school, but also like, you know, this is Alaska, so like, hunter education and how important is it for like kids to learn about guns and when and mm. you know why did it go away and you know after like school shootings became a thing like it seems like a contradiction to have guns literally in your schools but like what did we lose when we lost that um so it just turned into a really like really interesting story and so many people remembered it you know and there were people from like the 60s who were like in a you know in the shoot the school shooting club um and then you know all the way through like kids now who are like there was a, <laughs> a gun range in the school um so yeah it was just like everybody was totally into it and it was just one of those things that was like real normal for a lot of people um and also just like totally mind blowing for others. That is such a great story. I'm adding here, like what it can do is also bring important history to life. So it can 
cause you to look back instead of like most news, which is about kind of what just happened or what's about to happen. It can allow you to really zoom out and give some context. Um, that's fantastic. Right on. Um, Delina, did you have a, an example? Yes, we have a reporter working on a climate change series. Um, and one of the things that she noticed was that a lot of our local climate change experts were white. And so uh, she used a Google form to reach out to, to the community about things they noticed or questions they had about climate change and was able to, to um, and my, my bullet point is more diversity in news coverage. Um, she was able to connect more diverse voices in the community with these climate change experts. And in this case, um, had a um, black man interview the climate change expert himself. And, uh, you know, somebody who was really well, in, who had noticed a lot of things about urban heat islands and things in the areas that he grew up in and lived and was able to talk to an expert about that and really also be an expert himself. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love that. So the more diversity and also like change or like maybe complicate who is audience and who is source or expert, which is great. Cause like everyone's an expert at something in their own lives and what they're doing. So I love that. Fantastic. Any other examples here editorially or financially? Like did, has anyone seen uh, engagement leading to more membership or a cool perk, you know, during a membership drive. Okay, Elisa, yeah. Well, not for me. <laughs> we, are, we, are, we are paid to do engagement. But beyond that, um, I, one of our stations that I don't think we're able to join today is a KOSU in Oklahoma. And they were participants in America Amplified 1.0, and they've been doing ground source for a long time. They did some direct mailings. They were really trying to reach agricultural communities, rural communities in Oklahoma. And they felt that at the end of that first year, it really propelled them to a six figure grant that they just received to do more engagement reporting because they received so much positive feedback from their community at large throughout Oklahoma in general. So that's a win-win. That's fantastic. Uh, that is six figures is a, uh, yeah, that's impressive. On that note, too, in summer, feel free to jump in with some of the um, the wins from our partners. But I know that uh, WBEZ has had six figure underwriting for engagement uh, series uh, is one thing. Oh, I see a couple more hands are up. Sorry, Janice and then Catherine. So I would say we are on our way, hopefully, to making financial gains, but I'm not, you know, we're sort of new to engagement. And is it fair to say that maybe in the other column, um, what we're doing right now is building loyalty that we think will then translate to member dollars. You know, we've always looked at, you know, what we're doing here is concentric circles is like, you have to get them to listen first and then get them to really love what you're doing and then get them to give. Um, and a lot of the work we're doing, even if it isn't within the newsroom, when it's with our special events and that kind of thing, um, when we make these meaningful connections and when we tell people we want to hear what they think and they, we want their questions and then we actually act on those, I can see there is this a um, bit of a connection and relationship forming. And so I think we're, you know, hopefully, I mean, we would very much like to see the six figure um, situations, but you know, for now I feel like we're building. Does that make, does that make sense? Totally. And you're right. It, that relationship um, capital that you're building will translate to donations, memberships, paying to come to events that you're doing, getting swag, telling their friends about what you do. So that's, that's fabulous. You're right. Um, our partners at KPCC here in Los Angeles, where I am right now, um, they have found that their engaged stories make um, much more loyal and local uh, uh, members. So people are much more likely to become members and they're much more likely to consume more of their content in that way. Um, Catherine and then Maria. Yeah, so um, similar to the, oops. There we go. Oh, good, okay. Similar to the, the climate change initiative, um, we're doing a youth engagement initiative that is bringing more diversity to our airwaves and um, youth voices, which um, often aren't in public media unless it's a story about education or something that directly involves youth. But one thing that I'm thinking about in terms of the benefits are 
you know, often um, I've seen public media stations kind of use stock photos to, um, to develop a brand. But when you start doing more engagement with real people in the community and you spend time with them and there are visuals that are created and they start sharing it out, it doesn't feel like that self-referential, you know, we're, we're doing all the good DEI work. It's the community speaking about the good work that you're doing. I love that. That's so right. Authentic. I call it like our authentic marketing. Like if, if people are involved and they see themselves reflected in your stories, whether that's because they were named, they consented to having their photo or video used, or you hear their voice on the radio, they are so excited to share it with their friends because how often are, are regular everyday people in the news? Um, it's not often. It's usually news is about people either in total power or people with no power or someone who's done something outstanding, like won the spelling bee or something terrible and they're going to jail. So there's this huge space in between where engagement can help you have people who represent people you can identify with who are who are not at those extremes and start to um, attract more people to say, hey, this this newsroom is for me because look, look at the story. This is someone I identify with. So that's such such a great um, point there. Um, Maria. Yeah, I love that. And ours um, kind of goes along with that. The Muhammad Ali documentary, we are planning to work with a local organization, a local nonprofit called Young and Established, which works with young um, children of color in the community to actually kind of have like a, a combination of educating them on the six principles of Muhammad Ali and then also have them do a bit of a little writing project and then we'll record them saying like a one minute interstitials that we can use on TV, radio and digital saying, you know, what they've learned from Muhammad Ali and how they see those principles enacted in the community or how they have enacted them in their own lives. And then also going back to stock photos in 2019 or 2020, we started working on building up a local stock photo library because we didn't have a lot. We're using like standard logos for our news stories and stuff. And we noticed that whenever we were sharing on social media, when you had the photos of the actual people, we were getting more engagement on that. So we are also are doing that. And then the last thing is just for our radio pledge drive. Um, we used to do this all the time when I started here, but after the drive, we will actually have the radio staff call each individual that contributed money to the drive and say thank you. And so we started that again this year and people are always surprised to like hear the talent actually calling them. Like they're so grateful. And it's just really cool um, to actually talk to them. And I actually ended up connecting with uh, a parent of one of my grade school friends that way. <laughs> so that's Amazing. kind of the end of that feedback loop, you know, you, ask them for money, they give you money, say thank you on air, but then you call them again and say thank you. And it can also lead to them saying, hey, this is what I love. This is why I donated. And then you, you know, are getting even more feedback from them in that way. Oh my gosh, this is so great. So I'm adding here, like um, the creativity and innovation, like with the Muhammad Ali project, like you wouldn't be able to do that otherwise, you know, without that engagement. And then um, the morale booster, like it's so exciting to finally, you know, it can be so abstract to like be reporting every day, throw, you know, like throw your broadcast out there or, you know, publish your piece and then go on with your day and not even know how it's affecting people and what they're thinking about. Um, and so that's so great, like getting that morale booster directly from people saying what they appreciate. Um, I also saw in the chat and I put in here as well, attracting great talent. It can allow you um, to really attract, you know, fresh and excited people to work at your newsroom as well. Um, Summer, I see your hand is up and then we can Yeah, jump. just, yeah, and then we'll probably wanna to move to our next yep. segment, um, but just shouting out what Jenna Dooley said as well in Illinois, um, that the Report for America fellows that they were able to get um, really helped them increase the diversity of their newsroom. And they were able to professionally develop those folks and that work led to a lot of major single donations to support the beat coverage. So having folks that are really embedded in the community leading to a lot of kind of thankful um, donors. Yes, okay, that's fantastic. Like diversity can then like lead to more financial support when people see themselves represented. Yeah, they're all connected. Um, this is fantastic. I loved hearing all these stories that, that you all had. Um, the idea of on-air talent calling the people who uh, who gave is just brilliant. I hadn't heard that before. That's great. 
Um, okay, so we're going to skip this because I think we've all thought about what engagement can do for you. Um, but I want to just share some of the stats on uh, what we've experienced on our end. Again, this is a specific format that we do, but I think what Harkin has partnered, our, our partners have, have found is that these same principles, when you deploy them, really help up and down the funnel. So I'm not sure how many folks on this call are responsible for bringing the money in, growing the awareness of your brand, doing the marketing and the revenue or, or membership. Um, but just know that this kind of work leads to more popular stories like we heard. It leads to people spending more time on the page because it's really relevant for them because you're, you're hitting on something that's of interest to many different people that you might not have thought about before. Um, people will also opt into newsletters if you have, whether it's a Google form or whatever you're using to collect information from folks, if you're able to ask at that same time, hey, do you want to hear more from us? Um, sign up for our newsletter. You can at the moment where they're giving you something uh, for editorial use, also opt them in to being in touch with your newsroom in a way that might increase their ability to become a donor or member or even increase their membership if they haven't. And then you'll attract a ton more new people. So when you are featuring, let's say those youth voices, folks that um, you know had not really been heard before in your newsroom, except if you're doing an education story, um, they're going to share it with all of their friends and their friends might say, oh, I never knew about this local public radio station. What is public radio anyway? Um, they're going to learn about what you do because your people who you're engaging and featuring are going to be your best advocates for it. So it's a great way of, of building that top of the funnel as well. Okay, so now on to the holy grail of trying to get all these things to work <laughs> together and not be in conflict your metrics, your money, your mission, how can all of those things actually flow together so that they're not in conflict? Okay, let's see my slide deck. Oh, my computer's doing something weird. Let's see if it will go forward. Okay, all right. Let me go backwards a slide or so because my computer just went on the fritz here for a moment. All right. Okay, so uh, one of the assignments before coming today, and hopefully you had a chance uh, to get it, is your organization's mission statement. If you have it and you're able to like type it up or cut and paste it real quick, I would love to see that in the chat. Um, and then in a moment, I'll ask how many of you had to look it up and how many might not have one. So let's just wait a moment here for some mission statements here. This will actually be really cool afterwards to like share these mission statements with everybody as well in the chat if we can share out with this. Okay. All right. Um, I might just call on a few people to read yours out loud if that's all right. Um, Corin, can you read yours from Montana Public Radio? Montana Public Radio enriches mind and spirit, inspires a lifetime of learning, and connects communities through access to exceptional programming. Fantastic. That's great. Um, Audrey, can you read yours? Sure, sure. Let's see. WBHM is much more than a radio station. It is an essential public resource that enlightens and enriches our audience and makes strong connections to our communities through journalism that is fair, credible, accurate, and honest. Free from commercial and political influence, WBHM seeks to make Birmingham and Alabama a better place to live by educating, engaging, and entertaining the people of our metro area and our state WBHM is dedicated to the idea that an informed citizenry is vital to democracy and a thriving economy, and it celebrates diversity, innovation, and lifelong learning. Dang, that's a lot of goodness there. And I love the it's fact- read it, it's long. <laughs> I love that. And I love that entertaining is part of what you do. And I, we often find sometimes that engagement can create these opportunities for play that you wouldn't otherwise have, where you can talk about that. I mean, maybe the gun range story is an all play, obviously, because there's a lot of consequences there. But for people to be able to um, wax nostalgic about something or, or think about how things used to be or interact with each other in new ways. So I, I love that entertaining is part of it, too. Thank um, you. Yeah, this is great. All right, let's take um, one more. Maybe uh, Sarah Jane, would you be up for reading? Sure. Um, <clears throat> KMUW promotes 
insightful discussion and understanding of the issues and people that shape Wichita and our world by providing in-depth and quality news coverage, offering a distinctive blend of diverse music and promoting conversations that create a more engaged community. KMUW NPR for Wichita is an outreach service of Wichita State. Oh, that part you probably didn't need, but there, we're an outreach service of Wichita State University. Oh, fantastic. Oh, it's, it's really interesting too to see what's in common between these and then how long each of them are as well. So this, <laughs> ours is kind of long. No, it's fascinating. <laughs> I mean, long doesn't necessarily mean bad. Um, that's great. And uh, how many of you, just by show of hands or emoji, um, knew your mission statement? Uh, not like you could you know, read it with your eyes closed, but like knew what your mission statement was before the assignment. Uh, raise your hand if you if you were pretty clear on what it was. Okay. Okay, great. So kind of. Okay. And then how many of you had to look it up and had a hard time finding it? Okay, great. So it doesn't look like anyone was like, I don't know that we have one or I don't even know what it is. Okay. Yeah, but I definitely couldn't have recited it. Yep. Okay. That's good. You knew where to find it. Um, so this is just one of those things is that your mission statement can actually be one of the greatest ways to help staff who might not be on the engagement train yet to see that it's actually in your mission and your best interest to engage. Not only because you're a public media newsroom and you're supposed to be serving all of America and engagement is one way that you can better serve more people that maybe aren't listeners already or readers already, um, but it's also a way of connecting the dots between your mission and, and making those arguments to other folks who might not uh, see it as being core to their mission as a reporter or whatnot. So I just want to invite you to think over time throughout this project of, of how does your engagement work actually support your mission, because that can be the thing that like ends all arguments <laughs> at some point around whether or not you should do more engagement work or whether or not you should put some budget towards something that's more experimental just relate it to your mission however you can. And we are going to come back to the mission idea uh, in a couple minutes once we get into an exercise. So we'll keep those handy. So I just wanted to jump in about, um, I wanted to pivot for a moment and talk about success and how your newsroom measures success. So folks can go off mute for a moment when, uh, whenever you want, you don't have to raise your hands, you can just uh, go off mute. But tell me about how your newsroom uh, knows whether or not you're meeting your mission and you're doing a good job. I threw one in there to start with like awards because that's one way of being like, hey, that was an important story. But I'd love to hear how else you all are measuring success. Uh, I can I can go. This is Steve in Evansville. Uh, we we say uh, we measure it through audience revenue and recognition, recognition being awards. Okay, our, great. Okay, audience revenue awards. I'll put recognition there. Okay, great. Excellent. Who else has uh, ways that they measure success? And it could be, you know, depending on the position, I know the success might be different. If you're a web producer doing social media, maybe it's, you know, number of followers, et cetera. But like, let's, uh, let's bring a bunch of those things out in the open here. Audrey, I see you have your hand up, but I don't know if you are meaning to. Okay, <laughs> no problem. Anyone have more ways that you all measure success? I would say the cohorts that were accepted into. Great. So like a peer a recognition. Yep. Excellent. What are other ways? Like what, what's a reason that a boss might send out an all staff email or even just to folks in editorial and congratulate each other? I mean, metrics. I use a lot of web metrics, not raw, but, you know, that it goes through some sort of, um, you know, little calculation to sort of figure out what's important, but I rely on that a lot. And what, what kind of metrics are, are most interesting to you right now? Um, I mean, engagement metrics, I sort of look at, you know, big things that are, you know, I start with page views, but then sort of move on to like, okay, something was big, but like, where did and where people come from you know what a big story for a search audience is different than a big story for a social audience um and like people who just find it on the website yeah okay that's great okay so some digital metrics as well 
What about, is this still a thing where um, success is like getting a story on the network, like getting a story, a local story onto a national show? Well, I will raise my hand now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If the story uh, effectuates some sort of change yeah. or reaction from, you know, policy maker or something like that. That's great. Any other? We'll take a few more. Um, so um, source diversity is something that we do to measure our success. Um, so we um, work in specific communities and uh, we compare our source diversity numbers to census numbers to see if whether our coverage is truly reflective of the communities. Oh, that's so great. That's really great. Okay, fantastic. Well, this, okay, this is good. This is going to set us up for our exercise in a, in a minute here. Um, and feel free to add any to the chat as well. And I can always add to the deck before I share out. So I want to talk a bit about metrics um, because obviously now that we're in the digital age, there's so much more we can learn about what the public is doing. And some newsrooms will, and understandably so, um, just start to only count what is countable, but not the stuff that is a little bit harder to wrap your head around or, or, or have as a goal. You know, you might not say, my goal for this story is to win an award, like that might be a nice outcome for it. Um, but your goal is to serve the public. And how do you know you're serving the public? Um, in part, you have, they have to find what you're doing relevant and how they find what you're doing to be relevant are some things that you can't count. And so I just wanted to share a spectrum of metrics. These are just some examples of them, not, not complete here, but that there's kind of like on the very light end, someone just noticing or knowing that your brand exists. So they might click on something, they might hit play on something, but um, that's it. They just kind of bounce in and bounce out. But then if they're actually consuming something and really taking in that information, maybe you know it, like Jennifer had mentioned, like time on page or scroll depth, if they've gotten to the end of the article, time on site, return visits, these are things you can measure to, to make sure your content is interesting enough for people to stick around. And then if they react, um, hopefully they have consumed it before they reacted. I know that's not always the case, but they might um, comment, share, like, you know, contribute some sort of information or, you know, add their voice to the chorus. And then there's contribution. So they actually contribute some insight. Maybe they give you a story idea or they give you a source. Um, they, they give you something that's of value to creating your content. And then there's donations and membership, actual money they're contributing as well. And so this is again, an overgeneralization, but everything to the left that's kind of in the gray um, is still positioning the public more or less as a consumer. So they're consuming what you're doing. But when you think of the public as a partner instead, things can get really interesting. When you start positioning them and treating them as um, not only an audience member, but a source and potentially an expert, uh, you know, someone who's going to maybe provide uh, financial support for your newsroom, that's a really interesting space to start from. And so we'll get into this a little bit more later, but I uh, just wanted to preview some of these metrics and ideas. Okay. So now I'm to an exercise that so we're going to have the opportunity to do a little bit collectively, but then I will share out with all of you a template that you can do this exercise in your newsroom with your colleagues, just to make sure everything that you're that you're measuring everything that you are optimizing for is aligned. So my colleague, my former colleague Bridget Thorson, who's now at INN, um, had a brilliant she's she's a punny person. She just had a brilliant pun when one day we were talking about the fact that we work with a lot of different newsrooms and everyone in the, in the editorial side kind of has their own language and people on the revenue side or the commercial side of the house have their own language. And then the public has their own language where the jargon, the both sides don't really make sense. So we thought, man, we really need like a translation here for how all of these things connect. And so we talked, we joked about the Rosetta Stone, like we need a Rosetta Stone to translate between these three, um, these three groups. And so she said, how about a Rosetta Stone with the ROI meaning return on investment. And so here we are with the Rosetta Stone, we're really translating three distinct languages, uh, what the public cares about and needs, what the editorial staff cares about and needs, and then what the business staff cares about and needs. And we need all of these things to be aligned 
for there to not be that tension at the end of the day with how do we spend our precious time and limited resources is how to make sure these things are in alignment. And maybe your newsroom will do this exercise and find, you know what, we're actually doing a really great job. That'll be great. More likely is that you will find a few places where you'll need to make a decision and say, huh, if we really want to meet our mission or if we really want to do this, we should stop doing this one thing. It doesn't really serve us or stop counting um, this metric because it doesn't really matter for what our needs are. So I wanted to share out with you and I will again share this um, afterwards as well for you to all have and be able to, to draw in and create yourself. But this is kind of our matrix here for how we start to think about um, creating value and translating these languages. So on the top, we have content, trust, and value. Newsrooms, obviously, if you don't have content, then you're not really a newsroom. Even if that content is events, you're creating some kind of material. And then if you don't have trust, then it doesn't really matter how great your content is because no one's going to create, no one's going to actually consume it. Um, and then if it's not good enough content that they trust, there's not going to be anyone paying for it at the end of the day. So these are kind of our, our three major um, topics to translate into the languages. And then there's our, our public, editorial, and business. So the public really just wants to know at the end of the day, is this content helpful for me? Is it relevant? Is it filling some need in my life? Trust, do I actually believe them? How do I know that this is uh, information I can rely on? And then the value comes for whether or not uh, they become a member or they decide to donate or they give you their um, email address, et cetera. So these are how we're going to start thinking about our metrics. Um, on the middle bar here is editorial. You know, does it actually fulfill our mission? This is why I asked you to have your mission statement handy is just knowing like, is what we're doing helping to achieve this? Um, is it accurate and informed? Are we getting diverse sources? Are we hearing from people uh, beyond the usual suspects? And then does it make the best use of our resources in serving our core audience? And this is a question too of who is your core audience and are you, you know, using your time and, and energy wisely? On the business side of things, your newsroom might have a lot of different language for this. It might be KPIs or SMART goals or OKRs or key results. These are essentially how the business knows that editorial is creating content that people value enough to keep the lights on. And then in terms of trust, is what you're creating enhancing that brand and, and helping more people trust you? And then does it lead to actual revenue and margins that you can exist as a business on? So the thing I just wanted to point it out is that if you optimize for a different box here, um, things will change. If you, let's say, optimized your newsroom entirely by, uh, you know, does it lead to money? Your newsroom might produce different sorts of coverage than it would if it optimized for, is it helping the public? So I just want to note that some of these can feel intention. And because of the fact you all are in public media and your goal and your business model are about putting the public first, you're actually in a great position. Some of the newsrooms we do this exercise with see that, oh my gosh, it's so lopsided that the business is actually driving editorial and it's not helping the public at the end of the day. So the public is who everything should be centered on and how you know that you're you know, doing the right work is starting actually from the, does it fulfill our mission? So this box here, does it fulfill our mission right next to editorial is kind of the first piece of the puzzle to put in. And then everything else should make sure it's connecting to that. So let me just go on to the next slide here. And I wanna share, um, I just wanna share with you the actual template and I'll, I'll share this afterwards as well. So you can play at home, go at home. You'll just want to make a copy of this template um, to use in your newsroom so that you're not overwriting with someone else's. Oh, cat videos. Exactly. Like if you just optimize for our people watching something, um, et cetera, like cat videos can result. Um, OK, so this is a template that you can use after the fact. But for now, we're going to just jump in real quick and generate a couple of um, examples here for quantitative and qualitative metrics for how you know that what you're creating is of use to people and that it's engaging and useful. So anyone can start here, but feel free to just pick, pick a quadrant or pick a whatever, however many there are here and say, here's some metrics that could help you understand um, if, if this is actually working. Does that make sense? I can give examples if not. I'm like looking at you, Jen Pemberton, Jennifer, because I'm like, you do the metrics, anything you want to start here. 
Well, one one thing um, for the does it fulfill our mission um, quantitative is um, I count new sources and diverse sources for every story. So like of all the stories that we do in a month, how many of them brought in a new, a first time, first time on our airwaves source is what I mean by new source. Um, because that is our mission is to bring underserved and underrepresented voices on the air. And so in order to do that, we have to do that. And it's funny how we lose sight of that if we're not actually counting. Just like, so literally like in a week, sometimes I'm just like, if we've heard from all the same people, um, then we've failed, <laughs> you know? Totally, that is so great. And that's where you can always go back if someone's like, ah, this is too much, you know, it's taking too long to file these stories. It's like, then we're not actually meeting our mission. And no one wants to, you know, go to work every day and be like, I'm not helping the mission of the collective here. So that's that's fabulous to, to create metrics. I used to feel like was a pain in the butt and like besides the point of like, I don't wanna measure it. I just know it's important, but really setting metrics can be the most important thing to directing everyone's attention toward what actually matters and making that change. So thank you, that was a perfect example. Anyone else wanna share um, some quantitative or qualitative metrics that come to mind for any of these boxes? I'll just throw one in here, quantitative number of members and then how much they give <laughs> and qualitative here just uh circling back to some of what i heard um appreciation during on-air talent calls phone calls like when they're when they're calling back with people like that's a great qualitative um uh, metric and yeah, feel free to chat as well if you have anything you want to add there. I heard someone go off mute. <laughs> so I'll add a couple more here, like quantitative, is it accurate and formed? How many corrections <laughs> do we have to issue? Jen, can you explain one more example of like how to fill in the quadrant? So if I look at, for example, the intersection of public and content, yep. can you just explain to everyone one more time how to do it? Yeah, exactly. So this is just a way of starting to think about what metrics that you're pounding or, or what metrics could help you understand if the content you're creating is helping the public. So you kind of just use these two guides to say like, okay, how would I, how would I know, how would I have some kind of proof that what we're creating is being helpful to the public. So that might mean that uh, quantitatively, it's shared a lot on social media or shared on social media. Uh, so those might be metrics that you can tell, like people probably aren't, I mean, they might share things that are just salacious and false, but they're, most people don't share things knowing they're false <laughs> and that feeling like they're not gonna be helpful to those that they're sharing. So that can be a way, um, a proxy, to know if something was helpful. On the qualitative, it might be um, positive comments uh, on the story that it was really helpful. Maybe you created a voter guide that was really useful and helped people understand exactly how to get their ballot and you know what was at stake. So that's a way of understanding if the, um, if the content you created was helpful. So this is something that will take a little time to fill out in your newsroom, but I really think that getting together some folks from your business side and your editorial to fill this out will help you just suddenly have a have a clear idea of like, oh, these are things that we don't count and should, or these are things that we are counting that don't really matter. And so we can spend our time better elsewhere. And honestly, when you do this, you will start to see opportunities for how engagement can help you drive up the quantitative and the qualitative here. So this, this can become kind of, um, uh, a very key core document for your newsroom to return to, um, especially at the end of the year, sometimes, you know, that reflection on what should we do next year and what's our strategy and how does it work? Um, this can be a great tool for adjusting that strategy and seeing where engagement can play in. Um, and then we have one from Corinne. And one from yeah, the Corinne. chat. Yeah. 
um, public and content intersection, um, a qualitative would be if we get a message from a listener that a story helped them get a policy or idea they did not before. And Corin. Excellent. Something was helpful. Yep, totally. That's great. That's terrific. And this is this is one of those things that like this might be a, two meetings to have to kind of fill this out, but it's going to reveal so much and so much that can help you when you're setting your metrics for your engagement work as well. So with one of your, you know, the engagement project and work you're doing with America Amplified is to reach communities you don't typically reach. Um, this great idea that Jennifer shared is like, can you count the number of new sources and diverse sources to see how you're doing um, in terms of who stories are about, who they're featuring, um, how people are being, you know, cast in those stories. Etc. So um, this is just a, a great thing you can do when you're creating a project as well, and you're thinking about what are the metrics um, that can help you understand if you're if you're meeting the mission of that project. Okay, great. Yeah, and some are putting in the chat um, some more thoughts on metrics. So we just have about ten minutes left, and what I wanted to do, I'll share this out as well, um, is to we'll share the template that you can use. And then this is a great assignment to do. I know it's like, oh, great, you're giving me an assignment, but I will, I promise you it's going to be useful if you go through this exercise. And it doesn't have to take a super long time. Um, it'll help you to track what's valuable. And then it'll also help you tell your story. This is the great part for the folks who work in membership or who work in marketing, is it'll help you tell your story better. If you say our mission at this newsroom is to educate, inform, entertain, um, here are ways that we have done that. You can start to count and bring forward um, messaging to your public about how you're meeting the mission that compels them to donate and to give and to support and to underwriters and funders or philanthropies, major donors, those folks as well. It can really help the, uh, the business side of your organization tell your story and raise more money for what you're doing. And all centered on the public at the end of the day. It's not about having a business drive or having the business side of your organization drive editorial decision making. So I wanted to just come back real quick to this idea of what counts and how you know your relationships are centered on engagement. And this is uh, in the middle here is kind of our thermometer. So cool relationships are up top ones where you know you might not be buddies. Warm are like you are in partnership. You are deeply engaged. And these are not all the metrics you could possibly count, but this is something that can give you a little inspiration when you're filling out the Rosetta Stone to see what are some of the qualitative, or sorry, quantitative ways and qualitative that we could measure our effectiveness in translating value for everybody. So on the, on the top side here in the cool relationship part is when we're looking at the public or treating them as a consumer, positioning them as a consumer, we might count their clicks, their engaged time, or their scroll depth, and if they're coming back. That's us understanding how engaged are they as a consumer. Going to the right side, upper right, when they're a marketer, when they're helping us kind of spread the word, we're counting the likes, the hearts, the shares, the comments. And like, if they're getting the word out enough that other newsrooms are copying what we're doing, that means like the public has helped you engage as a marketer. On the lower right is where you know they are giving you email addresses, phone numbers, newsletters, et cetera. They're getting closer to you, eventually, hopefully becoming a paying um, uh, member, a subscriber, donor, et cetera. And then if you have premium paid offers like uh, events or merch or whatever that they are opting into, that's when you know you have deep engagement with the people that you are serving. On the lower left-hand side is where a lot of your engagement projects and practices come into play. And this is where going back to the very beginning of what we talked about, I know we've covered a lot of ground here, uh, is going back to um, this idea of the engagement ring and really listening to people and creating from what they're telling you they need. This is when you're treating the public as a co-creator. You're, you're taking their comments and you're not just counting them, you're actually responding or, or thinking differently. You're taking their questions, contributions, their votes, and they are participating in some way editorially. That's when they are a co-creator. And what we've learned at Harkin is that when you start in that lower left-hand quadrant, when you just treat the public as a co-creator and when you're creating stories or series or projects and you're thinking about engagement of how can people have a say, all of these other metrics go up naturally. When people are involved, they will click on the story, they will share it more, it's more popular, they will share it with others, they will become much more likely to become members, you know, 
you know, et cetera, pay you money. So this is kind of like the secret <laughs> of how to increase all of your membership, listenership, viewership, et cetera, is to start with engagement, start about thinking about your public as a co-creator. Okay, I'm gonna pause real quick. Jen, I see, Jennifer, I see you have your hand up. I have a question, which yeah. it got a little bit answered when you added the arrows to this graphic, but I, I don't think there are the same people on both sides of this. Um, and I'm wondering about the relationship because I feel like I'm working really hard at, you know, getting towards this editorial participation from certain communities that are not the same people who are like super engaged on the marketing and the membership side. Um, should they be the same? Should we be thinking about them the same? Or like, does it make more sense to be like, hey, I'm gonna work on this community and it's sort of, cause I'm on the editorial side, right? So like, it's not my pro, like I don't, you know, I want to, I want the like Filipino daycare worker to like share her story with me because I think that's really important. I don't want that person to like <laughs> give hey. a bunch of money to my oh. station. So like what, can you just explain a little bit more the relationship between the kind of two sides of this? Because we want, we ultimately want that warm engagement on both sides, but like, does it have to be the same people? That's such a good question. It does not. Um, so just like we're all multidimensional and like I might show up on your news site as someone who's uh, just scroll to the bottom of the story, but I haven't given money. But then another day I might be a source on your news site. I might show up in a different way. Like an individual can show up in multiple ways on this. And also some communities, given what you said in terms of socioeconomic status and how relevant you are to that community, they may not show up everywhere. So I would say start with those communities that help you meet your mission better. So start with working with those Filipino daycare workers. If, if they're not being heard and they have stories that are needed to be told and included, that is helping you meet your mission. And you meeting your mission will help these other things happen. The other thing is like, it, thought experiment wise, if you were to become a go to and you had a sizable community and they were hearing themselves on the air more often and they were going to your news site, it's very likely someone's going to give money, even if it's not a lot. They might, you know, sign up for the $5 a month or something because they really care, or they might um, sign up to be a volunteer for your next membership drive, or they might. Um, connect you to another, another source or something else. So it doesn't have to always result in money um, as the like end goal. We just know that when you position people and they see each other, these sorts of things will happen naturally out of it. So does that answer your question? It was a really good question. It does, thank you. Okay, all right, great. Excellent, let me just do a time check here. Okay, we have three minutes left. Um, so I might, um, I might move on, but no, again, you will have all of these slides as well. Um, I just wanted to, to mention when you're demonstrating your value, when you're telling people what your mission is and repeating it over and over again and showing them how they matter and how you're fulfilling your mission, um, you just have a lot more access for your newsroom, the people on the revenue side, to command high dollars in underwriting. Like people are willing to pay a premium, brands are willing to pay a premium to sit alongside of these engaged and public powered processes that you're doing. Here's an example from our partners um, in San Francisco. They have uh, KQED Bay Curious, sponsored by Sierra Nevada. Um, also, people get so jazzed if you create um, ongoing engagement opportunities to then sport your swag around town. So our partners at VPR and Vermont Public Radio have a series called Brave Little State that's public powered. And they sell out their t-shirts in every membership drive in like 20 minutes. And it accounts for like, I think the last time it was like a third of their membership drive dollars came when these t-shirts came up because people felt so connected and heard and engaged that they wanted to like wear the t-shirt. They wanted to be part of the brand. So I just wanted to, to say that it's it's really important to, if your revenue uh, side of the house folks aren't on the call today, please share the presentation with them because this is an opportunity that they might see to say, oh my gosh, I have, an, I have a sponsor who might be really interested in this series or whatnot. Um, and it's not violating the church and state thing. Like you are starting with, you know, who you're trying to serve and why, but they might think of, oh, this would be a great sponsor who would want to be seen alongside this. So, all right, this is, um, I'm just going to say this one real quick is like thinking about which question your newsroom starts from really creates all that innovation. So if you're thinking about what does the public want or what do they need? The newsroom is, is really deciding that 
Um, and you're only hearing from people like after broadcast, after publication, the types of stories aren't as varied. And you just kind of know success by looking at analytics and awards. But if you start with this engaged idea of what can we do for folks, what do they not know? What do they need that we could provide for them? The public tells you they will show up if you ask. Uh, if you ask enough, if you ask in the right places, they will tell you. And you hear before you spend your time and money. So you know that what you're doing is of value. And then the kinds of stories that result are like infinite variety, super creative. And you know, at the end of the day, you did your job by just answering their questions and helping them make sense of the world and uh, be informed and engaged community members. So I just wanna share with you, if this all feels overwhelming, just know every shift in pra practice and process starts small and it will gain momentum if you stay at it. So it might feel like, oh, can't reinvent the wheel here, but any project, anything can become a practice if you keep at it. And not everything you create needs to be made with engagement. It doesn't mean your whole newsroom needs to turn on it. You just need to do it consistently and uh, make sure people know about it. And that you don't have to compromise your mission for money if you just start with what the public is asking and you, you have engagement be the core of what you do. So I think we're at time and I was going to ask this, but just after we're done, just take a moment and think about what are, what are you thinking um, after this? What are you feeling and what do you want to do next based on, on what we talked about today? And we're happy to connect with you as well to talk through more of these topics and, and be supportive however we can. So I will stop share. I'll also mute myself so I can't talk anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jen. That was so fantastic. Um, we do have time for questions if you guys have it. And also as Summer and, and, and Jen have said, they are available. You can reach out to them independently. I love, I love the connection that you're making because we know that it's very, very real that if you center your journalism on people and your communities, that people will respond with revenue and with contributions and with subscriptions and with membership. So yeah, you're preaching to the converted, but you're preaching well. <laughs> Um, and I just want to let all of you guys know that her, these folks are coming back for two more sessions later next year. So we will go deeper into some of this. We'll talk about how really sharing the message of what you're doing and how to get that out there. So the, the, this is a really, really key part of our initiative this year, not just to help you with your projects, but how to make your projects sustainable beyond this year. That's what this is all about. Any questions out there for our folks? Thank you all for sticking with us. In the meantime, I know it was a little bit long in the middle of the day, but hopefully it was useful. We'll send out a survey eventually. We're thinking after maybe three different trainings, we'll send out a survey to see how you guys are feeling about all these. Great, and Summer and I will follow up and send Elisa the links to share with all of you with the, the slide deck, the template, um, some guides and things we touched on today. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, everyone. Good luck out there. And I hope you have a restful week next week. <laughs> yes. Happy Thank you. Oh, I put my cranberry relish uh, recipe in the chat. If you missed it, just reach out to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take that one too. All right. Thanks, Elisa. Bye, everyone.